Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about the signs and symptoms of a pulmonary embolism, and then we're going to end by talking about the Wells criteria for predicting the likelihood of a pulmonary embolism. So in a past video, we did talk about the Wells criteria for deep vein thromboses. This is going to be a different Wells criteria. You do have to be careful which Wells criteria you're looking at. Is it for a DVT or a PE? Um, so make sure you pay attention to that. Here we're going to start with the signs and the symptoms. This is not the Wells criteria, uh, but some of them will overlap. We'll start with the symptoms of a PE. The most common symptom of a pulmonary embolism is dyspnea at rest or with exertion. This is experienced by 73% of patients with an active PE. So this shortness of breath is not just seen with exertion. It's also seen at rest. That's a big distinguishing point. If somebody just gets short of breath, with exercise, it could mean that they have COPD. It could just mean that they're grossly deconditioned. Okay, But the fact that they get it at rest, potentially, is a big red flag. The second thing that patients may experience is pleuritic pain. This is just chest pain in the lung areas. And it can be difficult to distinguish from a myocardial infarction uh, because of differences in patient presentation and maybe slight differences in where the location is. But a big distinguishing factor uh, between a pulmonary embolism and an MI is an MI is more of a pressure chest pain. Like something that's just weighting down a deep pressure on the chest. Whereas a pulmonary embolism is going to be more of a sharp chest pain. In fact, if a patient complains that they have a sharp chest pain, that actually rules down an MI pretty strongly. Because an MI is going to be more of a pressure, a PE is going to be sharp. Patient might also have a cough. They may have orthopnea. They may have calf or thigh pain or swelling or both. What we're going to see on the Wells criteria is that uh, an active DVT strongly rules up a pulmonary embolism. Also wheezing and hemoptysis. Hemoptysis is coughing up blood. Notice that only 13% of patients with a pulmonary embolism are going to have hemoptysis. However, if the patient does have hemoptysis and there's no acute injury that would have caused coughing up blood, that should put pulmonary embolism on your radar pretty strongly. Now for the commonly presenting signs, tachypnea. So that's just an elevated respiratory rate. That's the most common sign that a person has a pulmonary embolism. Again, we have the calf or thigh swelling, erythema, which is redness, tenderness or pain, palpable cords, also very common. This is basically just symptoms of a deep vein thrombosis. Here's an example of this calf swelling, erythema. Um, again, this actually looks like a deep vein thrombosis. And if a person has a pulmonary embolism, they likely also have a deep vein thrombosis. A piece of it just broke off and now went to the lungs. So if they have this, you do need to be worried about a pulmonary embolism. Okay? And tachycardia, so an elevated heart rate, not as common. The next three can be detected via auscultation. So rails, decreased breath sounds, and also an S2 gallop, which is just that accentuated pulmonic component of the S2 sound, heart sound. And then the final sign here is jugular vein distension. Here's a jugular vein distension right here on the right side. It's just an accentuated, exaggeratedly thick jugular vein in the neck. And why might you have that? Well, if you have blockages here in the pulmonary arteries, eventually you're going to have a backup of blood that's going to limit the amount of blood going back to the right atrium, right? And so these veins coming from the head drain into the right atrium ultimately. And so if there's a backup of blood, then you're gonna have a backup in the neck. And that's why this vein becomes distended as you see here. So those are the signs and symptoms of a pulmonary embolism. Let's now take a look at the Wells criteria for a pulmonary embolism and understand that there's two systems that are used for points. The one over here on the right is the simple Wells, uh, where everything's worth one point. That is not as commonly used, but this system over here on the left, where some things are worth 1, 3, 1 1.5, this is the most commonly used Wells criteria for a pulmonary embolism. 
Now let's go through the individual points here. So the first criterion is clinical signs of a deep vein thrombosis. Hopefully you understand at this point why it's three points and so it strongly rules up a pulmonary embolism. You're not going to have a pulmonary embolism unless you previously had a DVT. Because remember, the DVT is the source of the embolism, right? So if you have a DVT, some of it will have to break off in order to have that embolism. The second thing here is an elevated heart rate. So basically a tachycardia, heart rate greater than 100 beats a minute. That gives you 1.5 points. Then recent surgery or immobilization, also 1.5 points. Remember a recent surgery or immobilization, both of those things are risk factors for a DVT. And considering a pulmonary embolism comes from a DVT, this will also moderately rule up a pulmonary embolism. Also, previous pulmonary embolism or previous DVT, again, moderately rules up a pulmonary embolism. Then you can see hemoptysis, that's going to add a point to the total score. And also malignancy, so active cancer, is going to add a point to the total score. Then the last thing here is any alternative diagnosis is less likely than a pulmonary embolism. Another way to put that so it's less confusing is that a pulmonary embolism is the most likely diagnosis. So if there's nothing else that can explain the patient's symptoms, uh, that gets you three points right there. And so basically what you do is if you suspect that a patient has a pulmonary embolism or that they might, you screen them for all of these criteria right here. And for each one that they have, you add that many points to their total score and then you just add it all up at the end. So let's suppose that a person had clinical signs of a deep vein thrombosis, they're coughing up blood, and they have a heart rate of 150 beats a minute. Okay, so they have clinical signs of a DVT, there's three points. They're coughing up blood, that's hemoptysis, that's another point, so that's four. And then they have a heart rate greater than 150 beats a minute. It was 150, as I said. So four plus 1.5, that's 5.5. So that's their score on the Wells criteria. Now then you come down here to determine the likelihood of a pulmonary embolism. So for our purposes here, if they have a score of four or less, then a pulmonary embolism is unlikely. So if they had a score of one, two, or three, or even four, PE is unlikely. However, if they have a score of five or greater, then a pulmonary embolism is likely. And in our little example here, they had a score of 5.5. So we would assume they have a pulmonary embolism and we would treat them as such. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the signs and symptoms of a pulmonary embolism and how to use the Wells criteria for a pulmonary embolism. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.